So welcome to this new mini-series, which is about the Cold War. And we've called it Seven Minutes to Midnight. This is a huge and complex subject, running over four decades, in which we'll cover a number of key events in, a, in some episodes over the next few months. And this is running in parallel to the Unconventional Soldier, Soldier podcast, so please keep listening. So why the title, Seven Minutes to Midnight? The Doomsday Clock was a symbol or measurement that represented the likelihood of a human-made global catastrophe, and in the case of this period, this would have been a nuclear exchange. In 1947, at the start of the Cold War, it was deemed to be at seven minutes to midnight. This naturally changed as the superpowers lurched from one potential disaster to another, and in 1953 it went to two minutes to midnight when the superpowers started to test hydrogen bombs And in 1984, it went to three minutes to midnight as the US and Soviet relationships reached its lowest point. But what about the Cuban Missile Crisis? It didn't change, apparently. Really? Yeah. And I don't know whether they were not able to record it, but the the fallout from from the Cuban Missile Crisis was they set up the hotline. Right. Because prior to that, they had no method of talking to the, the governments and the superpowers at the time. And hopefully we're going to cover that in greater detail when we move on to episode two. But there's some interesting pieces that came out from that, that event, being so close to the US shores, and the importance of communication, because we could have just stumbled into something because the communication just wasn't there and we didn't have um, the bat channels as such. This episode, or this series, will give the listener an overview of the stalemate between the superpowers, which eventually led to the collapse of the USSR, and, although a win or success for the USA and Western European powers, I would suggest that the Cold War still impacts European and Western stability. So my question, Colin, did the Cold War cease in 1989 with the collapse of the war, the fall of the USSR, and all the satellite states, or did we just move into a new phase? Well, obviously now we're talking with great hindsight, but I would argue that when the wall collapsed, the Western Allies did think it was the end. Yes. And that's when they started to draw down all their forces, uh, reduce their armies, and concentrate in other areas. So the Soviet Union became preoccupied with its loss of world power. Yeah. They had a near revolution. Yeah. Do you remember? I think it was 1991. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a yeah, coup was with a coup. tanks yeah. running through Moscow. Yeah. And at the same time, some of the old Soviet Union states and some of the satellite states were starting to find their own feet. Some were becoming independent quicker than others. They were trying to learn a new way because they weren't um, um, influenced or controlled by a centre. And then obviously very soon after that, Yugoslavia broke up and became a massive war in Europe, which people still don't can think how big that was, and how that today is still impacting on stability in Europe. At the end of the Cold War, there was some attempts to hold out an olive branch. There was talks of bringing Russia into NATO. Yes. Uh, but that sort of just, this, uh, just didn't, didn't happen. No, no. You then had the fact that Russia was broke, yep. economic collapse, the rise of the oligarchs, You then had things like the War on Terror, where the West basically just pushed Russia to one side a lot of time, wouldn't listen to what they were saying, cracked on with the War on Terror. The Russians had their own problems with the wars in Chechnya and other places. So I would argue that, with hindsight, as I say already, that the Cold War went on hold, went on on ice. Do you like like we've tied that in with cold? I like that. So it went on ice, and over the last couple of years with Ukraine... Yeah, it's like Cold War Two reset. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, it's interesting to to look at history post Second World War. Uh, the occupying forces um, in Germany. Germany was split. Russia in the east. France, Germany, uh, France, UK, and America. We drew down very quickly after the end of the Second World War, just to rebuild our own nations and productivity and economics. The Soviet Union didn't. They still had a view on expansion and did. And they still posed a massive threat because they still had a massive armed force 
that we couldn't counter. And it will lead into nicely into the Berlin airlift, which was the first test of the Allies and the, the, the superpowers. And realistically, the first, I won't say shots across the Cold War, but it was the first major test. And if Berlin had fell, that would have been hugely symbolic and actually could have pushed us into another campaign. And also, let's not forget, you had basically capitalism versus communism. Yeah, yeah. I was reading the other day there that US GDP between the years 1941 to 45 doubled. You know, very, very rich country, where our country was virtually broke. Yes. Still paying off war loans up until about 10 years ago. (laughs) Talking about the sort of proxy wars you had throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, whereby the Americans were concerned about the domino effect, and that was one of the reasons they went into Southeast Asia. They felt that if one country fell to communism... It would continually go down that way. Yeah, I also have to be mindful that at the same time there are tensions between uh, communist China, yes, and communist China and communist Russia as well o- yeah, along their yeah, border. Yeah, yeah. So it was a Cold War across the world. Yeah, it, it, it more global. I think the the Chinese piece it, it, again. Obviously, when we were serving, our, our threat was the Soviet Union. But the expansion of communist China post Second World War, its expansion, its influencing, led to, and we're going to talk about the Korean War in another episode. It led to the, the Allies being tested in various places of the world and taking away our main focus, which was the European campaign with the Soviet Union, into far off countries and a huge amount of investment because we could not afford to keep losing, like you say, the domino effect those other places of influence. Well, let's also forget that, that America, Bank of the World, set up things like Bretton Woods post-war. It set up it's very similar to the ideals of the uh, what was the early European Union, i.e. Yeah. bring all the countries together, make sure they're all wealthy, yeah. break down trade, yeah. open borders for trade, yeah. spread the wealth, and then that will reduce the chances of war. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of idealism between the two there. And the idealism in America, you know, that idea of American exceptionalism, shining city on a hill, that's just as much of a, a doctrine as was yeah. communist Russia. Yeah. But one that we accepted. Because yeah. Because that was more Along our with Coca-Cola. Yeah. 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 All the other advertising and the commercialization and everything else, then you'd see that. And some countries saw that as an invasion as well, didn't they? Not only with American troops oh, turning oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. But especially look at the French. They hate all that, don't they? They think it erodes their French culture. Yeah, I, th- I think um, because we we were part of that, we don't see ourselves as, uh, let's not say the baddies, but we were influencing other countries um, in, a, in, a, in a bad way. We thought... You know, bringing that culture in, bringing the the economic freedoms that come with that as well. We think that's a good thing. You know, everyone should have a car, refrigerator, a house, nice job, money, holidays. And we think that's the norm. And that's our norm. It is, but also I think some people are naive to what America wants sometimes. Because I think what they've got to remember is, is that America's aspirations are also about suiting the interests of America. Oh, yeah. Now, I had a chat on a podcast recently with a US Marine Corps colonel, and we're talking about lend lease. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of this, but you know, one of the things about lend lease, when they gave us these destroyers and all the rest of it, that was more symbolism because a lot of those destroyers were useless. Yeah, there was, they, they were, pre, they were pretty pre Second World War. But it was a symbolism yeah. of it. Yeah. And also, what they wanted was things like Diego Garcia. Yeah. Leases on those islands where they could uh, project strategic power. Yeah. And also, one of the other aims of the American war was to make Britain less of an empire. They wanted Britain's empire off it. They, want, they didn't want the French to have an empire either. You know, and a lot of that was they wanted to be the preeminent power in the yeah. world. And they achieved that. Yeah, well, and, and still do. Yeah. So today, with the emergence of China, its economical advances and the West dependency on it, which we're seeing more and more, and with global aspirations of projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative going into to areas like Africa, the Far East. And at the same time, Russia's continual strive to remain a superpower, countering an expanding EU and NATO and seeking other partners with Iran, North Korea, Syria, and other African states, such as the Central African Republic, we're starting to see, again, blocks forming. Yeah, definitely. I think the 
part of the question was, um, you know, when did the Cold War start? And I, I have a view on this. I, I think it started before the end of the Second World War. And there was also many significant Cold War events post-Second World War, which we were not able to do anything about the, the Allies. We didn't have the will anymore, I think, after fighting in, in Europe and fighting in the Pacific. Um so we had the Berlin airlift, as I mentioned, was the first sort of test for the Allies to keep Berlin going, and, and it's an enormous logistical challenge. The Korean War, which was the first UN operation, but again, it was a proxy war. And it was so soon after the Second World War that it's always considered the and forgotten still on, war. On yeah, paper. And still on it's still... There's no war, it's not been No, no, it's, 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 a, it's a ceasefire. And they still negotiate every other day. There's still tensions. There were still rounds getting fired over the border, but just people don't talk about it. And then every so often we see in the news the North had just launched another um, intercontinental ballistic missile towards the Sea of Japan and other areas causing a massive tension. But it's interesting as well because, right, so basically what I've said here is now we're looking at Cold War One, Cold War Two. Yes. And we've just entered Cold War Two. Yes. And we talked about when did it start, but we never talked about really where, where did phase one end or cold war one end and you often read it that it said that reagan's star wars initiative bankrupted the soviet union and an ability for the american economy to basically outpace the soviet union was what did this but i was reading uh, a quote the other day from gorbachev and gorbachev basically turned around and said chernobyl the nuclear incident chernobyl played a huge part in the downfall of the soviet union that's interesting and why was that then? Why, why? Um, I think it was because it showed that the state's power was limited. Oh, they yeah, had the yeah. show trials. Yeah. Uh, the, the the massive impact it had on that part of the country. And it still have it again. You look at it now. Yeah. Soviet soldiers were digging in around uh, yeah. Chernobyl recently. Yeah, yeah, and when the yeah. inspectors went out there, they found that there was far more nuclear radiation in the soil than they expected well, after after, after it being disturbed and they could measure yeah. it yeah yeah so that was an interesting thing there that gorbachev could place a downfall on and also things like afghanistan as well yeah i think i think afghanistan played a big part in this because it was not just russians it was the ussr and we've all learned lessons in afghanistan it was a proxy war obviously the western allies were supporting the mujahideen and other elements Soviet Union got bogged down into an, um, an unpopular campaign. And everyone forgets that Afghanistan borders the what was the Soviet Union with the, with the stands in the north. And it did lead to people at home being unhappy with that situation, the bodies coming back, the casualties. And and again, I think it proved the kit was, wasn't as good as everyone thought because I think during the Cold War, one of the things that I remember was we were always considered their kit. We were always looking at the weakness of the kit, but obviously they had a mass amount of kit, and their big thing was artillery, and they they could use um, mass and attrition, uh, and that was their big tactic that we obviously in the West could not match at all. But but here's think, an interesting thing. Mm. So the, the Russians now in Ukraine have lost more people than they lost in the 10 years or so they were in Afghanistan. Yes, yes. But it's still not having the impact it had in a communist state. Yes. I'm wondering if that's because when it was the USSR, the other countries would have put pressure on the centre. But no, you would have yeah. had Ukrainian troops, Estonian troops in there so as the well. So the pain was spread. The pain was spread, but also the voices would have been, because you couldn't hide it as much as they seem to be hiding it in Russia. Because in Estonia, they would have a different government, although it was a communist government, and they would have felt pressure from their people, and that pressure may have got pushed into but the also centre. Also, in Ukraine now, a lot of the people that are doing the dying aren't the middle classes no. from no. Moscow and the other big cities. They're, they're, they're from a lot of what used to be the stands, yes, aren't they? Yes, yes. And I think also, got to remember, during the, that period of the Cold War, the Russians invaded Afghanistan, but like you say, we had Star Wars going on. We had the arms race. We had economics um, as well racing ahead. So there was a lot of pressure on Russia to fight a very expensive war in Afghanistan. And there was going to be no 
minerals, oil or anything coming back from Afghanistan to help um, with the treasure side. And at the same time, the Allies were putting this ma- mass amount of pressure on them as well. I mean, to maintain at that time during the peak of the Cold War, the amount of nuclear weapons to a war state is enormous. I mean, everyone's reduced. It's not only because we want to reduce nuclear proliferation, but also there's a cost to maintaining this equipment. It's a huge cost. Our standing armies cost a fortune. Absolutely, and nuclear weapons are going to be even more. And you've got to keep them to a certain standard, and you've got to be able to launch them. There's no point having thousands if you've only got two launchers. They're, they're, it's only as effective as the ability to get it to the top. We saw that in first Gulf War. Yes, we had to strip out the divisions in Germany to, to fit out what was essentially two brigades, two armoured brigades. Absolutely. So they would have the same problems on a much larger scale. Yeah. Kevin and I, two amateurs, read, read a little bit. We might have got some stuff wrong there, just our opinion. But there were many other significant Cold War events that we'll have a chat about on this podcast. The Berlin Air left. The Korean War already mentioned, Cuban Missile Crisis, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. And we'll go into some other key events around the beginning of the Cold War. And we'll look at in depth at the Stay Behind concept, which Kevin and I have done on the Unconventional Soldier podcast. And we'll also look at UK tactics and the order of battle, focus on artillery components. So it's not all battles and politics, Kev. We served in Germany. What else are we going to be covering in I mean- the West? Germany of the time. Well, West Germany, I mean, we served, and you know, there'll, be, there'll be people out there that served as well. Finally, remember the tax free cars, the cheap goods, and other benefits. But I think the Cold War was it, it, the garrison troops out there, they were, they were very constrained. You, you operated under a permanent high readiness state, and people don't realize that because once you're in it, you, you don't realize you're in a high readiness state. So some people remember the term active edge which was the, the crash out. Um, basically, it was an exercise that was run all the time and it was, it, it was um, all over West Germany. Units were crashed out on active edge, inspected and expected to get to uh, their start points. And all, when you say crash out, it was literally like yeah. guns, yeah. tracked vehicles we, out the main gate. Uh, They'd be ripping up the curb stones. Absolutely. We, 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 we were sent out on exercise for a couple of weeks from an active edge call out because they had to call people in, obviously the marry people in the quarters, they might do it on the Sunday, which is always the slow point. Every single vehicle, if it could drive, it would drive. If it could drag another vehicle, it would drag another vehicle. And you go for that process. You go to the ammunition point and they would simulate fully loading up with all war ammunition, logistics, rations, and then push you out. And this is at a unit level. So here's a question for you. Yeah. What plans were there for the families? Because if you deployed into Hyde to go to war, <clears throat> were the families going to get evacuated? Because oh. that's something I've never read about. No, I, I don't believe you can. I think your families would have to make their own way back towards the UK. There was no massive plan because there was no one to do it. If you think about it, if BOR crashed out, you're going to be within 24 hours, you're going to be moving to your start points. There's nobody left to do the logistics. There well, is no. Well, if anybody knows any better, ex soldiers mm-hmm. out there who might be involved, or there's any planning for moving families back, uh, you can write in. Yeah, let us know. yeah. But let we're, us know. we're both not aware of it, are we? No, no. And I don't believe there was a massive plan because I think what we've got to remember is if the Cold War got to that tension where troops in West Germany, and that's not just the Brits, that's the Americans, the Dutch, and everyone else, what you're also going to have is. Lots and lots of refugees sitting on the border with West Germany. And you East saw Germany. that in Ukraine. Yeah. So there was 55,000 soldiers in the British Army of the Rhine. Yeah. And you look at Dortmund where we were, there yeah. were five regiments. artillery regiments. Say 600 in a regiment, that's 3,000 people with dependents and school teachers and other Massive. people like that. Yeah. There's probably about another 6,000 or yeah. so dependents yeah. and enablers. It's a lot of people to move back when you think about it. Absolutely. And... How are you going to do this when you've got the German population also moving back from the borders? And they're going to move back into the cities. So there's going to be a mass, you know, uh, trying to picture it. If you look at Ukraine as the example, you're pushing troops forward up the autobahns. You're moving to your start points. And at the same time, on the other side of the road, you're going to have people 
moving as quickly as possible out of those villages and cities right next to the um, the border. And you can't rehearse that. No. And what's the chaos going to look like? And how are you going to get back? All ferries are going to be commandeered in, in France and Holland and everywhere else to go and pick up UK land forces and start moving them forward. Yeah, I think it's, it would have been horrendous. Did you do exercises like Lionheart? I mean, yeah. just tell people Lionheart involved. Well, I was, I was, I was going to say that during the period of the Cold War, some of the largest exercises since World War Two. I mean, Exercise Lionheart involved 130,000 UK personnel and equipment. So basically, we stripped the UK. And that included the territorial army, as it was, but also something we spoke about before, the reserves. So everyone who did, had colour service, residual colour service, so you leave the army, how many years you've done, you might have six years residual. During that period, you, every year, you were expected to do a report to a barracks. And when you left the army, you also kept a certain amount of equipment. If you remember, the respirators, certain amount of uniform and such like. You do the reporting every year. But during these big exercises, they mobilise the reserves as well. So not only was we moving UK land forces, the regular element, into BAOR, we were mobilising the territorial army, which takes a little bit more time. And at the same time, we were also mobilising... The reserves, the those still had colour service. And these guys, let's not forget, so in a gun regiment, you'd have six guns and a peacetime establishment. Yeah. In wartime, it was eight. eight. And those guns... The territorial would be sta- ...would be crewed by reservists, yeah. wouldn't they? Yeah. But on active edge, the first thing we had to do was we had to hook everything up. And we never had enough people to move every single vehicle. So we'd have vehicles towing other vehicles. Mm-hmm. And... Dare I say it, some of the equipment we had was that old and that worn out. Could we get it out of the gate? You know, it was it was a challenge. What I remembered as well, and I forgot about until recently, was weekends. Everyone used to knock off, but that's not true. Again, in Germany, because you had to have so much equipment running, I remember many times the workshops were open, and that's when we were doing pack lifts. What we're talking about this yeah. on Boxing Day... Yeah. Christmas leave, only a certain percentage of the regiment. 70% of the regiment had to be in, in country. And traditionally, it was the single soldiers that went home to the UK. Yes. The married guys stayed at home. Yes. They stayed in Germany. Stayed in Germany, so. yeah. The pads would stay there. But you had a, a certain amount of man in all the time so that there was enough people to move the equipment. And if you're on leave, you would you expect it as well to obviously try and repatriate yourself to Germany to backfill but you might not necessarily go back to your own unit because they might already be deployed and you might be part of the second wave. I think we talked about things like um, the Americans used to do reforger every year. National Guard units, everything, wasn't it? Tens of thousands of troops. Yeah. It was a massive investment, and we forget how much we spent on defence, but so across the whole of NATO. Didn't they have big warehouses of equipment, yeah. the Americans, in yeah. Germany, didn't they, yeah. for, for these yeah. guys? Yeah, They, they had, they had forward-mounted everything. They had to because there was no way they'd be able to move a division of armour across by boat in time. A year after uh, Lionheart, we had Brave Defender, which was, again, 60,000. Huge exercise that we, we can't even contemplate now because... Uh, that's a whole... That's more than... That's more than... That, well, <laughs> well, 72, allegedly. 72 in the army. So 130,000 UK personnel and troops would have been the whole of the BAOR a massive, significant amount of um, UK land forces. And not forgetting that this was into BAOR. At the same time, we had the commando brigade rushing off into Norway. Northern flank, yeah. And we had the ace mobile force pushing into Turkey, to the other flank, which is another huge organisation, multinational organisation. But the commando force was going to be, what, five, 6,000 with Navy elements. And you've got another five or 6,000 getting pushed into Turkey with the ace mobile. And let's not forget... It was in the papers the other day there about Germany thinking they made a mistake with cons- conscription. It was Germany was making a massive comp- contribution to NATO. I think they had something like 50 divisions. Yeah. But you have to because it's your country. It's your country, You've yeah. got no choice. You've and got that, to that throw decision of fighting on German soil was always quite controversial. Yes. Because it was likely to turn into a wasteland. But they, you know, people deride Germany's contribution in the current climate 
But in the Cold War, they were certainly pulling their weight. I, I think you're right. Germany would have ended up being the battleground. And the other European states that were throwing people into Germany would try and keep the fight in Germany because that would be the buffer. So East and West Germany would have been absolutely decimated. There would have been, you know, it would have been empty because Western group of forces, the Soviet Union, would have been huge. And even if we didn't go to nuclear, just with conventional weapons and the amount of troops, if you look at what the Ukraine's looking like, um, it would have been absolutely horrendous. And with the refugees. Just looking at that there, I just quickly Googled that and I got my, I got a little bit carried away there. It was 36 brigades, 12 divisions. I thought 51 divisions after I said it was a little bit much. 36 brigades though. Still a lot, isn't it? Yeah, with all the logistics that go behind that as well, each brigade, it's massive. If you like a bit of uh, weaponry, whether that's rifles or tanks. So we'll also be discussing a bit on research and development. And as we already said, the Cold War started quickly after World War II. But interestingly, something that's said about World War II is that the US and the UK improved the weapons of the 1930s throughout the war, while Germany developed the weapons of the 1950s. And then eventually that sort of brought them down a little bit. And by that, I mean, if you look at the Spitfire, for example, it went to about, I don't know, 15, 16 marks of Spitfire. Yeah, yeah there was, yeah. Engine changes, yeah, yeah. all the other bits and pieces. Well, the Germans were really getting into designing jet fighters and assault weapons ahead of the time, but not enough to make a difference at the start of the war. And what did that mean to the Cold War then was that the US wanted to use German scientists like Werner von Braun for their Apollo missions to get the astronauts on the moon, There was also German generals taken across to America to advise on their battle schools and tactics, techniques and procedures. And something we were discussing earlier today, there was a, we're watching the world at war, always good in a boxing day, isn't it? Much to my wife's concern. But we're talking about how they talked about denazification, but did they really do it? Because a lot of those generals were needed to bring that massive German army we've just talked about. yeah to be the Bundeswehr from the Wehrmacht and the SS, yeah. and they needed those generals to do it. They needed yes. those people who fought and, for the Nazis. And, and some of the junior officers who would eventually become the, the, the next set of leaders in... And, and some of the politicians as well. When you start looking yeah. at some of the politicians, if you de everybody... As you, you saw just, in Iraq, de yeah, you would have had to start again from, from scratch. Um, and again, that's the same when we talk about this, it was the same in Japan. But also during the war, before the war ended, it was pretty soon that people at Churchill and Patton, even though he's a controversial figure, Patton, uh, they're often quoted by saying that their eyes were starting to turn towards Stalin yes. and the communists yeah. thinking, this is not going to end all peaceful and happy, like well, we like to think. They could already see the land grabs. They could already see the intent of the USSR its desire. I mean, I wasn't aware. The Soviet Union didn't declare war on Japan. They had some agreements, but didn't declare war on Japan until the dropping of the first atomic bomb. They declared war before the dropping of the and second And there was talk of them coming on our side and yep. taking Japan on, wasn't there? Yep. And they'd already been fighting border wars with Japan, I think, hadn't they? Already? There's controversy over some of the islands um, between Japan and Russia and some areas in the old days, and then it became the USSR. But I think they had an agreement. I mean, 1939... Germany and the Soviet Union side, the Ribbentrop Agreement Pact. So that allowed the Germans to invade Poland. But what I didn't realise was the Soviet Union also invaded parts of Poland. Before 1940, the Soviet Union also ex- expanded into Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, parts of Romania. So, again, when you're looking at the Cold War, when did the Cold War really start? It started during the Second World War with the expansion of the USSR, as well as Germany expanding to the east and to the west. Then agreement in the east will not affect you. You leave us alone. We leave you alone. We'll share the spoils of this campaign. Well, did they want to share? At the end of the day, the Soviets often looked at the west and thought, yeah. you didn't take very many casualties. Now, they threw lives away, like you're seeing in Ukraine yes, now, yes, human wave yes. attacks. 26 million Russians were killed. Yes, American casualties, I was reading recently, were less than 1% of the total. Yeah. I think Britain lost something like 300,000. Yeah, it's not, it's not a massive amount. Compared to what... But we, we were a bit more careful with people's lives. <laughs> but but I think, again, though, we were... 
we'd learnt those lessons from the First World War because obviously during the First World War, the UK and the Commonwealth and, and, and the Americans, once they came into the First World War, we'd gone through that attrition. We'd learnt that lesson and we didn't want to learn that lesson again. And plus, we, we, we don't have those numbers because, I mean, we forget the, the UK was still recovering from the First World War economically and building um, uh, armed forces and such like. And then we had, obviously, Dunkirk, which then had a massive impact on the British forces. Now, I didn't realise how much the Soviet Union started doing that. And then uh, my question to you is, I, I, I believe the arms race started with the development of the atomic bomb. The race was for the Allies to beat the Germans to build the atomic bomb because the Germans had... They, they understood technology and they were racing ahead. They had the V1, the V2. Like you say, they were looking at jets while we were looking at propellers. But also, the Soviet Union was also racing for the atomic bomb. And there would have been a lot of espionage between the Allies as well, not only against um, the Nazis, but also between the Allies, Soviet Union, versus the Americans and the British? Well, the Western allies of the war, less the Soviet Union, had a nuclear advantage to about 1949, I think it was. I think this is where that doomsday clock, we'll have to have a look at that, but I think there was a period then, once the Soviet Union developed their first and did their first test, because until you've done the test... You but know, that test proved they were developing yes. a nuclear capability. Yes. And from then, so that, if it's 1949, I think that's the, the year. From then on, really... That's when oh, the nuclear arms race started. The Cold War ramped Went up. hot, if you like. Yes, yeah. And, uh, and as I say, until the Cuban crisis, we didn't have a hotline between the President of the United States and the head of the USSR. So there was loads of trip hazards. But what we didn't have was scale on the nuclear side. We still only had what they could develop. It was never going to be the, the thousands that we had in the 70s or 60s and 70s and all the rest of it. But there was definitely a race. And then towards the 60s, we started moving towards the intercontinental ballistic weapons, which then changed the tactics that we were using. So prior to that, we were using airplanes, bombers. Then there was the race with technology to get missiles. And then there was the submarine uh, development as well. So submarines, as they are today are probably the best platforms for these devices because they could be out, they're not detected, and that provides a mutual a mutual agreement, mutual, mutual, mutual destruction. assurance destruction because if you don't know where it is, you can't take it out. And once the missile goes into the air, really hard to destroy nowadays because of the counter stuff. But bizarrely, that mutually assured destruction helped keep people in check from using those nuclear weapons. Yes, and again, this, the, going back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, when they started putting missiles into Cuba, when they started putting the launchers there, it got really tense. It got hot. Although weary of war, post-Second World War, with the Allies, what I found really interesting was the research and development aspect regarding to military weapons and platforms, I believe was at its best because we had the momentum still running from the Second World War. And as Colin, you mentioned... We borrowed a few German scientists and some of their technology, which again, not only for the space race, but for, for missiles and, and for other uh, bits of equipment. And it was interesting that only a few years after the Lancaster bombers were operating in the skies of Europe, we, the UK, world leading in, in jet development, we had bombers such as the Victors and the Vulcans. These, these look space age even today. And these were designed to fly into Soviet territory and deliver atomic and nuclear weapons deep into Russia. Submarine development, as I mentioned, was racing ahead because it became the, the best platform as well, the, one of the hardest to hit. And at the same time all this was going on, late 40s, 50s and 60s, the UK was fighting the other campaigns, so America was and everyone else, but we were fighting using equipment and weapon systems that we'd used throughout the Second World War. Um, for example, the Vickers machine gun, which was invented in 1912, the British Army used it through to 1968. So we used it in the First World War, the Second World War. We used it in Korean War, and we used it as a defensive weapon as well throughout the Cold War. But let's not forget, in 1982, 
we were using mainly weapons and equipment from the 1950s. Yes. And uh, we were using LMGs, light machine guns, yeah. that are rechambered brain yeah. guns yeah. So from the Second World War. Absolutely. I, I, and so we were leaping ahead in some areas, but in some areas, you know, we still had thir- no, pattern 37 webbing, 303 brain guns, Vicar machine guns, and Lee Enfield rifles in the first sort of proxy war of the Cold War against, obviously, the North Koreans and the Chinese communists. And a lot of these little wars were drawdown of empire wars, yeah. or, or in some cases, if you want to be unpolitically correct, trying to hold on to empire wars. It was. I, I think the Korean War was the ex- the first That's probably expansion an exception, of the communist threat. In, that was a UN deployment, though, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a yeah. UN deployment, but it was basically... it was what would now be considered mostly NATO and Commonwealth soldiers uh, fighting in, in, in Korea against North Koreans, communist China, and and anyone else that was interested in the, the, the expansion of communism, which very, very quickly, 15 years later, America was involved in the Vietnam War in exactly the same challenge. Or oh, less than 10 years when you yeah, look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and interestingly, we'll cover in a later episode as well, that some of the tactics used by the battery in the Stay Beyond role were developed during World War II by the SOE, such as rat runs, you know, escape corridors, agent contacts, dead letter boxes. One times pad, which we talked about before, is, a, is, a, is definitely a Second World War piece of equipment, Morse code and all the rest of it. Even though we started to move into burst transmission, we were still using the tactics that were successful during the Second World War in the same theatre, just a different enemy. And again, something we have mentioned on a few of the podcasts, The Unconventional Soldier, all three service chiefs in the Falklands War had been, served yeah. in World War Two. And I think that was important because when we started to lose ships, if we had oh, they'd have service rat, no. chiefs, yes. <laughs> if we had service chiefs that hadn't had the experience of the Second World War where convoys were getting hit all the time, bombers were going over to Germany and bomber crews were getting killed. 30% losses. 40% losses. We wouldn't have had that experience. And I, I'll call it appetite. We'd have been more risk averse and we, we couldn't be. So some of the campaigns the UK are involved in post Second World War, and these are just some examples. Palestine, 1945 to 1948. The Korean War, 1950 to 53. The Kenya uprising, 1952 56. Malaya, which went on for a long time, 48 to 60. The Suez Crisis, 1956. So during that period, not only were we trying to build up our forces for the Cold War to face the most powerful adversary we'd ever dealt with, they were going to be more powerful than than Nazi Germany. We also had to go and either support other operations, support other countries, uh, partners around the world. So we had troops all over. So I've got a question for you then. Yeah. Okay, we're doing all this, fighting all these withdrawal from empire battles, Korean wars. We've got a huge army, air force and navy deployed yeah. all over the world. How do we afford it? And we're paying back all that debt to America. It's amazing we could afford it. When you look at now, what's our spend on defence now? It's around 2.2%. And what was it back then? Well, the GDP in the 20th century... We had GDP of seven percent in the Boer War. In the World War One, um, was that seven percent spending on defence? Yes, and GDP. And so GDP, seven percent of GDP was defence. Was on defence during the Boer War. Yeah. In World War One, in 1918, it was 47 percent of GDP because we'd gone all in. But to be fair, we were an empire then. We were quite rich, but also. The armies were massive. Oh, yeah. It's all, it, it's all, it's all, it's all economy of scale and, and, and proportional. Also, you get to the point where you've got no choice. You've got to throw everything out. And we were on the war footing, which is we haven't been on the war footing since the end of the, of the first phase of the Cold War. World War II, defence spending peaked at 52% of GDP. And like you say, as soon as the war finished, it started to drop. So 1947, it was 16% of GDP. But at the same time, 
You still had that debt. But we're virtually bankrupt and we're paying that debt to America. And, uh, and we're, we're rebuilding. Funding, and we're rebuilding and yeah. we're funding all those wars. Absolutely. And we're rebuilding Germany. Yeah, yeah I know. It's amazing when you think because about you it. Because th- everyone forgets the Marshall Plan wasn't just, here's a plan. But we were recipients of the Marshall Plan as well. Yes. So, um, but we had to pay into Germany. We had a yeah. sector. We had a responsibility because Germany was divided up. Obviously, it's East and West and Berlin was divided into four sectors. We were responsible for our sector. I think it was a, a British captain that was re- running part of the car industry at one stage. Oh, he's the guy that found the VW Beetle plants yeah. and got yeah. it up and running. Yeah. He he virtually started Volkswagen yeah. post World War Two, and we still don't get the money. He was, off a, he was an engineer's captain, wasn't he? Yeah, his name. So you, you had loads of people going in, and and part of the rebuild of Germany was obviously employment. Um, uh, before we became it, we were still an occupying force, making them nice people. We were part of an occupying force. <laughs> Um, but also we were rebuilding massively. At the same time, we had troops still posted all around the world because, again, we did, they didn't all come home. And then moving into the 50s, 60s and 70s, GDP obviously dropped for defence spending. But we're still spending an enormous amount of money because obviously we had nuclear proliferation. We still had a huge army in Germany. We still had a big navy. We had many garrisons around the world. If you think about it, from Hong Kong, Malta, um, small one in Gibraltar and other places. We still had these massive garrisons and some were accompanied, some weren't. And at the same time, we had all those little conflicts running between 1945 up to the present day. In the mid-90s, defence spending was cut massively. And I think, as you alluded to, we decided that the Cold War was over. We'd won the Cold War. And like most Western nations, we want to spend money on something else. We made the armed forces a lot smaller. We got rid of loads of equipment. And up to about 1997, it was 3% GDP. What's the NATO standards at 2%? It's 2% across yeah, yeah. NATO. But we were at 3%, which is something now they're trying to aspire to now, and we're struggling. We've got 22 or something, and it'll go up by 23 or whatever, but it's slow. And we were at 3% in 1997, and that was after the options were changed. Well, I was reading we bluffed our contributions to oh. NATO because we, we include army pensions and stuff like well, that. It, in it, it's all part of defence spending, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but some people argue, no, that should be it, 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 And separate. I think some of the other NATO countries will do exactly the yeah. same because they because they all include all defence in. It is a cost, isn't it? Yeah, massive cost. And yeah. you and we both get army pensions, mate, so you know, we're happy well, to contribute uh, to the defence of the country through our pension. And I think if you go back to the Cold War days, when we had the colour service piece still, so you'd have, reserve, you'd have, you'd have the, the territorial army, then you'd have the, the reserves. So me and you, up to 55, we'd have a colour service, residual service. Although you're getting a pension, actually what I've still got is I maintained a, um, I'm not going to call it a high readiness, but you've got a four. So if you've got, 200,000 veterans still on colour service of various amounts. You probably had to mobilise 40 or 50,000 of those. Not with your knees. Not with your back. <laughs> but it still gives you a huge amount. Of, now, we haven't got that today. We don't have that colour service residual service. We don't have that, I'm going to call it a second line reserve. Well, there's nothing there. It's empty. So who can man the UK elements, you know, the guardian of places, key points. We don't have that to throw everyone else into the front line. And I think our mindset needs to change. We need to get back to a peer-to-peer um, uh, war where you have to throw everything in at the beginning because there is no second place. You can't lose. And as NATO, even as strong as NATO is, we have to throw the whole lot in at the beginning because you've got to try and... Is NATO strong, though? Yes, it is. I think it is. And I think it's even stronger now Finland's joined than Sweden is. Because Finland... Well, they're, they're, but they're countries that take the credentials with NATO seriously. And also, prior to joining NATO, they took defence very seriously. Yeah. They've got a huge reserve. They've got some of the best equipment. And they are a very credible And then you've got force. the likes of Germany who I read recently would not be ready properly for a major war in Europe for another 15 years. And I think there's going to be a number of countries in Europe. Probably in the same include us, the way we are going. Well, I think it's because we all structured our armies for the wars we were in, not for the peer wars, because the war on terrorism shaped our defence budgets, it shaped the equipment. And after 20 years, 
we're not shaped right anymore. So we've got to get back to the peer on peer, which is basically we're fighting an army that is as good or is not as better as us, that we don't have air, air, de- 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 um, uh, air defense and. Yeah, where we don't own the air. We have to fight yeah. for the air. We have to fight for all the different battle spaces, including cyber. That's, so a, po- that's a podcast in its own because ab- I, I think I could take a few arguments down there that a lot of people would probably be interested in, but we're running out of time. So hopefully what we've done in this little episode is just set the scene for this miniseries. So we'll look at the Cold War. We'll look at some key elements of it. Obviously, Close to our hearts is the stay beyond concept, and we'll widen that a little bit as well into what other nations were doing on the stay behind. And it's it's very much dictated from the Second World War and co- other countries that were occupied during the Second World War and what they did. And we'll, and we'll also obviously feedback from yourselves. Good guests coming on as well. Uh, we've got some very good guests, but we'll keep that to the next one. Oh, upset like that. Yeah, yeah. The Cold War upset. Um. So hopefully that's a scene set. Please send in ideas, questions. Please answer the question about the family side because I don't believe there was much of a plan to re- repatriate the families during that initial phase. Uh, that'd be quite interesting because because if you look at the logistics just to get one family out to Germany in the old days with the MFO boxes and all that, you try and move in a thousand families. And some of those ways were needed a heavy lift capability. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I, I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> so that's it for this episode. And hopefully we've set the conditions for the next episode. And we will look at the key events that shape uh, the stance between the superpowers. Remember to keep supporting the unconventional soldier. And I look forward to you joining us again soon. You'll find us on the, all the usual suspects as well. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I still accept... I was so glad you got that in. I was about to remind you. I I think snail mail, you know, first class stamp's gone up, but it still gets there. And again, thanks to Nick Beale for his continuous support to this series and offering technical support through his company also.